So welcome, the last session here in How To, and the session is an in-between session uh, of a workshop which already started this morning. And it's a real pleasure to have the World Building Live session now here together with uh, invite also the public to join the workshop of the production designers of, uh, of the Berlinale Talents Program. And uh, you started already uh, with some participants of Berlinale Talents this morning. And uh, Juan Diaz B, he is uh, a former participant, a production designer director based between Berlin, LA, and Colombia. And um, you, you are the guy who guide us through also a creative process, thinking a little bit more out of the box always. And um, I'm happy that you also brought some other people here. It's a cooperation since a couple of years already with the UCS World Building Institute in Los Angeles and also Alex McDowell is a very long time companion of this program here. So um, Juan, you will introduce the panelists here, the uh, leaders of this workshop and uh, I would like everybody to invite to this creative process and to being part of it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, so two, two lines about the collaboration that we have been doing. Uh, the USC World Building Institute has been here. Uh, thank you to the, to the talents for seven years of um, a space to think in a different way and to promote what we are doing and the research that we have been doing in world building for uh, over a decade. So um, I think the space here is precisely and what we wanted to create right now in this intermediate session between the workshops was to present to you the process that we have been doing, right? So um, I initially will introduce our guests that have been working with us and are part of our um, research and uh, network of fantastic um, interdisciplinary um, people in, at the Institute. So I will begin with Kamal Sinclair. She's the director of the New Frontier Lab at Sundance. She has been working in media, interactive uh, film in all kinds of senses, and now she's promoting further the new narratives in the landscape that we are living in. So give her, yeah. Trisha Williams, she is a game designer, interactive designer based in San Diego. Her company is called Pigeonhole and they are working with uh, social games for change and they are trying to develop narratives that actually tackle not only how to entertain but how to change through uh, the gamification of the narrative. So. <laughs> Itamar Kubovi. He is based in New York and he's the director of a company that is called Pilobolus. They are trying to um, make dance a new way of also intervening and hacking the narratives of our world. So working in a, in a, in a space between the most uh, analog and the dance and the body and the collaboration with science and understanding what is the narrative in our times. So give a round of applause. And now I'm gonna leave you with Alex McDowell. Alex is the director of the World Building Institute. Uh, he's a um, very acclaimed production designer, like I, I, I'm sure you have seen his films, Minority Report, uh, The Fight Club, and right now, can I say it? Uh, Alex is designing the episode nine of Star Wars. And, um, but mostly he has been pushing the limits of narrative media and design process to understand how uh, it will work to create stories in the world that we're living in and how to push change into the world through narrative. So I'm gonna <laughs> give the voice to you. Thank you. Can we put up the, this, uh, the slides? Can we put it up now? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, cool. So hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do a little, at the risk of being repetitive, going to do a little overview of why, what we're um, uh, doing in these two days, um, contextualized by world building. Um, so 
The other people to introduce are the amazing group of, of um, uh, <laughs> talents who were with us this morning, already developing um, a really rich narrative for this world that we're setting up. Um, so all of these guys are, uh, we're all kind of one group here. In fact, really, we're here just to support their narrative and what they are developing uh, as part of this initiative. So the context of this, is, I would call Spaceship Earth 2050. Um, this is now, we're moving into the second year. Uh, the first, the very first event was here last year at the Berlinale um, with the talents where we looked at the future of cities through the lens of the refugee camp. Uh, the average length of time that a refugee spends in a camp is 17 years. Um, and it seemed that we should not be thinking about this as a temporary state, but actually a way of thinking differently about cities themselves. That is coming kind of underneath the, or within the umbrella of the Buckminster Fuller idea of Spaceship Earth, which is that we are all on this spaceship and we need to learn how to drive it. Uh, we need to, to learn how to take responsibility for it. Um, 2050 is, is a target that um, we're focusing on because we're making it this the kids edition, essentially. The two-year project is to develop a relationship with children from 6 to 16 who are going to write the manual for Spaceship Earth that they are actually taking responsibility for in 2050. Um, so we have a, an initiative going on at USC right now which um, is working with uh, a, a very varied group of interdisciplinary students. Uh, Trisha is leading the class of that at USC, um, working with young students um, to come in and start developing literally the manual for Spaceship Earth. And the framework for that is kind of in the broadest sense looking at um, these different lenses. The ocean, the ocean is the lungs of the planet, leading directly or directly connected to climate change, which in its turn is directly connected to at least one whole segment of the idea of migration, climate refugees, um, and that in turn leading to the future of cities. So today we are focusing, today and tomorrow we're focusing on the idea of a future of city with another lens within that. Um, that lens um, within this sort of world building frame where we would perhaps describe this as hacking the future, um, world building is a way of us extrapolating forward, building a holistic world, adding the layers of narrative that allow us to push it into a, into a, uh, a future that's driven both by fiction but by uh, information, by, by um, solid research and domain expertise, threading that back into the present so that we can um, modify our own behavior in the real world and move towards a different outcome in the future. Um, and so our, our lens this time um, is on rebellion, on the idea of surveillance and spectacle in the, you know, it, it, it's, it seemed difficult to avoid uh, confronting directly the weird fiction that is evolving around us, starting with, uh, you know, things like Brexit, with uh, the new, hesitate to call him president, but I guess it's officially what he is. Um, <laughs> 45, yeah, thank you, exactly. Um, uh, so how do we react to what's happening so rapidly in the real world that we really can't separate fact from fiction anymore? Um, so in, and to that aim, we've actually s thought that we would look at a situation that is just a few years out um, at Berlin, at, the, at our city here in 2020. It's the closest distance we've ever looked in world building. We, 10 years was the minimum distance we were looking at because we were really looking for fiction to, um, to become a strong component. But since the fiction is already firmly in place, we think that we're, we're kind of um, dealing with this in, in, the real, in real time. Um, so world building, um, I would just quickly define as this combination of storytelling, the way in which we make sense of the world around us and how we move those narratives through generations or across um, uh, entirely different audiences, across audiences. Um, the design of the world itself, how does the world become a volatile space to provoke new stories? So how do we get to understand a world deeply enough, in enough detail, to allow multiple stories to come out of it organically uh, and develop the rules of that world so that it can be persistent? 
And then what systems do we use? And this is something as a designer I'm deeply interested in. What systems do we use to transform the narratives from the sort of tradition of author-directed, single author directing of the viewer's gaze uh, into a much broader collaborative um, process where we combine our expertise and we combine our diversity and we look at how that generates and, and stimulates uh, stories and then turns itself into a process of multiple stories in a spherical world. Uh, so storytelling, this idea that tr tribal storytelling is where this started, making sense of the world around us, um, which evolved into the great mythologies with an aggregation of, of multiple, you know, thousands of storytellers all contributing to um, these large narratives, whether they were the religious narratives or the myth mythological narratives, um, that began to change with the advent of the printing press into this more single author-directed series of stories where we've been looking to single authors to tell us what, where we should look, really. The proscenium of the theater, the, page, the, the words on the page, um, the architect's vision, et cetera, et cetera, for the last 600 years. But we think that we're going through this rapid uh, transformation now. It can be sort of typified by what's happening with spherical storytelling in virtual reality, but that's really just a kind of entry point, I think, for thinking differently about story. Um, everything that Itamar has been doing for decades is really about, the, is the core of this, which is the theatrical experience and allowing the audience to step onto the stage itself. Um, and I think we're trying to kind of emulate that condition with a world build like this. And then world building becomes this um, way of, of encapsulating that and turning it into a new semantic, turning it into a new uh, set of provocations out into the world um, so that our narrative is genuinely disruptive and genuinely allowing us to survive in the real world, in this new kind of unfamiliar world. Um, and the story, the world building kind of process is sort of typified by this, the idea of, first of all, the context. So we're saying, uh, sorry, we're saying uh, Berlin 2020. Um, uh, what are the rules of the world? What are the economic conditions? What are the climatic conditions? Where does, you know, how is climate ch change a, a significant part of that conversation? How is migration a specific part of that conversation? And then how do we start looking at the city itself at a, at a number of scales? The outer sort of city where we have a holistic relationship with, between politics, infrastructure, culture, and energy, moving into um, the uh, community or the neighborhood, into the family or the group, and into the individual at the center, where each of those high-level um, ecologies, politics, structure, culture, energy, convert as you become closer and closer to the individual into mind, body, self, and fuel, for example. And then can we use those generic categories as triggers for narrative that allows us to dive deep and start doing these um, investigations, these, uh, these core samples into the world and extract narratives from them and, and, and develop the verticals. So I would say very simply today, this morning, this was the horizontal. We started exploring a world. We started laying out the conditions of rules of the world in two different groups. Um, one group sort of focused on the analog. One group sort of focused on the digital, or there's a huge amount of overlap. And they kept separate, and they, derived, they developed um, ideas and stories. And then we folded those together, which we'll present back to the group as a whole. But none of you guys have heard sort of the other side. Um, story. So w what, what evolved in this first pass? And then tomorrow will be the verticals. How do we actually turn that into narratives uh, of individuals? Um, the example I would use quickly is this uh, project we've done in the last year around a small village in Lagos called Makoko. Um, we imagined uh, economic collapse in 2019 that led in turn to a new economic system based on water, where water has been privatized and a very poor village, real village, 100-year-old fishing village called Makoko that is uh, sitting on top of, uh, of water, on top of a new kind of resource for itself. And how does character, environment, and the viewpoint develop out of that? Um, so in this case, this was sort of the world build that evolved. These are the numbers of verticals that over a period of two semesters, the students went into, investigated everything from um, 
the area boy gang culture to uh, the floating school education system, which is a new, which is a real thing that started in 2014 in Makoko. Um, what does police and punishment look like? What does uh, market? What, how does the marketplace work? Um, what is hacking? What is sustainability? Um, what is agriculture? How do you eat, etc. Um, and that involved in this case, we looked at a day in the life um, of six different characters, and we drove them through the world. And to some extent, this is an opportunity tomorrow for the group is to actually develop characters that are going to test the world, whether it's a day in the life or just the existence of these characters with their own narratives who have to survive in this world of 2020. Um, how do we give them enough information for them to actually have truth and come out of, the lag, out of the fabric of the world and have a real identity? And then can we push their identity out into the world itself, into the real world, as an outcome of our work tomorrow uh, in order to provoke, in turn, to provoke new narratives and actually perhaps inspire a new kind of um, behavior in this new world. This is, uh, so this is something, I, we, we released this on, um, on my website and immediately I got back from these great artists in London, Rebecca and Mike, uh, where their first provocation was to oppose the fact that we're doing this at all. Um, that we're gentrifying the problem by even talking about it in this, in this community. Um, so, you know, the first provocation is, you know, are we entitled to have this kind of conversation about um, rebellion in, this, in a real political situation in the real world that has an effect on real people? How does narrative actually um, really have a place to play? Is, is narrative the equivalent of fiction? You know, we're looking forward. Does that automatically mean it doesn't have relevance? Or do we actually have which I believe to be true, an incredibly powerful tool at our disposal that all of us are here to understand better and to start exploiting. How, how do we become the resource for the next you know, decade? We're all, you know, everybody here who is a storyteller is going to be in increasing demand because it's clear how important narrative is in the way that, that the political uh, environment moves forward, how everything is being understood. Um, so, as I say, first provocation is this. Um, second provocation comes from Jean-Michel Michel Basquiat from Beyond the Grave. Um, uh, build a fort, that's where we are now. We've built this world. Um, what happens uh, when we set it on fire? How do we set it on fire? What is rebellion in this, in this situation? So, have I missed anything? No. Oh. Hello. Um, so, um, the thing here, what we did, and then we're going to go into this world and then try to explain you what this world looks like, we, was to um, follow the process be before rebellion, and it's to understand the system. And um, our first step was to try to understand how the system ca can be optimized into a certain kind of oppression, um, to try to understand how the surveillance and the spectacle can be fortified by certain actions, by understanding what are the weaknesses or the vulnerabilities or the expectations of people, and then tackle that through the systematization of such kind of vulnerabilities. So um, just a quick thing in terms of the surveillance and the spectacle is this kind of uh, duality or dual force that has been driving always the oppressive systems around the world. From, from, from the beginning, the message and the narrative has been as important as the subdue of the people that live within that system. So uh, we're going to go in. Are we ready with that? Yeah. We're going to go in with the presentation of the world that we visualized by trying to understand how this system of oppression can be optimized. So if, yeah, okay. go on. All right. Um, so do we can go to the next slide. Oh, you you want to click for me? OK, you. thanks. Thank uh, okay, so we had um, a really robust conversation this morning, a, a lot about, we had a, another framing in here besides uh, surveillance and spectacle that was important um, around what is sacred in, inside of a particular world and what is negotiable, right? And in the sacred, there's certain values that we kind of have to build into the world fundamentally 
that stay consistent even as, as we kind of build this fort, so to speak. And then there's negotiable things. And so a couple of the sacred things that came from the group, again, all this is group generated, um, for Berlin in 2020 and Berlin now to 2020, one was autonomy being a core value. Another was envi the environment being something sacred. And the last was alternative, like ways of um, kind of subverting uh, the, the mainstream and, and creating an alternative way of life. So holding those three things sacred. And then on the other side, did you guys have something else that was sacred that we should put out on the floor? Because that, that came out of the digital group and out of the analog group. Was there anything in, in addition that was sacred for Berlin? Yeah, we, 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 we were talking often, I mean, when we try to understand what is that make people vulnerable and what are the sacred, kind of the realm of the sacred, we understood that precisely uh, feeling uh, safe and feeling that they can they can be they can plan their lives or at least have a certain security for their families or for their own so social circle was one of the main things that will be always kept as the sacred and then as much as you don't touch that then you can negotiate there were two categories that we identified the sacred and the negotiable so the sacred is the things that you if you cross the line people will alert but there's other things that if you press in a, in a particular way or if you find the strategies, you can negotiate people into subdue to those certain kinds of structures. And, and sanctuary or, or safety came up in our group as well um, and came, kind of came into the design of Berlin 2020. And then what was negotiable was identity and cultural identity, especially in a world where identities are shifting uh, because of political alignments changing where people feel like I can't call myself this anymore if this is my president kind of a thing. Um, so that just, that's a little bit more of the world. Now we're going to get into the specifics of the kind of history, this like 2017 to 2020 history that gets us to the world. Um, you can go to the next slide. So we thought a lot about the pressure on Germany specifically with migration, with climate change migration from war refugees as well, or actually some say that Syria is the first climate change uh, war. So all of that combined, you have this pressure on the system from migration, uh, which is part of the psych psychology of, of happening in Germany uh, at large. And then next, uh, we looked at um, the provocation that something happened. There was a, there was a spark. There was a, something that triggered Im immense fear in the community. A terrorist attack happened somewhere in Germany. People died. And that then started to unlock um, the, the fear-based narrative started to work inside of Germany as a whole. So the people started to become more afraid, they started to become uh, you know, more retracted, more suspicious, more prejudiced, and, and, and essentially that environment led to uh, a moment where the right wing was able to take control in the 2018 election. And so now you have an environment where you have right wing state government uh, that is promoting these narratives of fear, and Berlin wants to resist. Berlin does not want to be in that narrative. Berlin wants to be a sanctuary city, uh, and, uh, but still with, with oh, that's a very pixelated picture. <laughs> Pulling random things off the internet. Um, so now that there's a right-wing government that is taking control of the state, there's uh, kind of the EU starts to fall apart. And so now we, the EU Brexit happened, other, other elections happened around Europe, and there was the xenophobia, and then we've lost the European Union, and the euro now does not exist. We don't have that currency anymore with which to negotiate our economies. In that environment, uh, Berlin um, decides that they're going to be a sanctuary city. They get defunded by the government. Uh, they no longer have that resource, and they come up with an alternative way of uh, basically in that kind of chaos trying to establish um, uh, something on the value system of sanctuary, of environment, on, um, on autonomy, and an alternative lifestyle. I'm going to pass it to Tricia to explain what, did they, what emerged out of the chaos. What so what emerged out of the chaos was one corporation stepped forward and said, why don't we give you an alternate way to live? You don't want to live like this. You don't want to identify with this. Let's reinvent that. So what our wonderful world builders came up with is the Digital Universal Income System, or DUIS, <laughs> probably. 
So that is specifically access through these devices that these corporation gives to people that opt in. It's a free system. And you can choose to be a part of it. It's all inclusive. There's no racial barriers. There's no barriers of any kind. There's no income barriers. What it does, it gives you a device that lives in your home and something like a Fitbit that you can carry with you. And it accesses this system. Every month, this system will give you a certain amount of credits, very much like currency. But it's all digital, so there's nothing in your pocket. It's all right there. You can spend those credits on food, on services, on the basic needs of life, maybe some lavish things here and there, all sold through the corporation, things that you need in order to, in order to survive. Go ahead. It's not, it sounds like, um, it's not restrictive, right? We, we still have a free economy. Yes. And it's uh, founded by a capitalist institution, but because our, just like, it's not ra rations, but it's just certain resources that um, are equal. But that's, I guess, where the ideological pro issue comes up. So you should continue, I guess. No, that's a good point. It's not rations. They don't say you are only allowed this. You are given this to choose on what you purchase. And next up, it's also a geolock system. Therefore, if you're outside the boundaries of Berlin 2020, it doesn't work. So if you start traveling all over, and you're like, OK, I'm going to have to figure out another way to, that that works, keeps everyone inside the system. It keeps them geolocked to making Berlin better. And one of the biggest things that this system actually does is it promotes environmental regeneration. One of the things that we found sacred in Berlin 2020 is the environment, is everything around us. We want to make sure that we take care of this city, we take care of this planet. And instead of just sustaining, we don't want to just sustain. We don't want to say, OK, well, this is as good as it'll ever get. We want to actually regenerate it. So these particular systems collect data on your consumer habits. Do you output more than you input? And through that system, the data gets collected and you get rewarded through it. You get rewarded through extra credits, you get rewarded through uh, different things that you can purchase. And if your input is greater than your output, that results in dark days, which means that you can't access it for a day or a week, maybe. Like if you did something bad on Facebook and you can't use Facebook for a week. One of the things that this particular system thrives on is the connecting to other people within the system. This is a, if we can say it, a liberal stronghold. This is where the people went to rebel against this particular government that approached from here. And so they have created their own cultural identity in time, inside the city through this system. Do you want to, anyone want to speak on that one? Cultural identity came out of what you guys found negotiable. Why did you find that negotiable? What? He, he's texting right now. He can't be bothered. Uh, no, I, I think okay. we need uh, you to help us with this particular point. Can you tell Henrik again what his point is that he's going to make? <laughs> what was the... the Yeah. And how, I guess, the people in the society can be able to let go and figure it out. So, and, and sorry, I was the just point that we were talking about earlier, which I think is really fascinating, is, is a question of where you belong. And, and this is something which is being challenged for me personally. I've been in London for 20 years, and I believe very strongly that London and England itself belongs in the European Union, but unfortunately, the country where I live doesn't agree with me. And so that's a challenge to where I belong. You could say that in the next years here in Europe, um, all European countries will have the same challenge, possibly if, if the elections in France and certainly in Holland in a few weeks, I'm, I'm from Holland originally, if the elections there go in the same way, then the identity that I have as a Dutch person is again challenged. And so I think it's quite interesting to think about where you belong and how quickly that is changing and the influence that this may have on the way that you spend your time and your money and how the society around you is structured 
to accommodate that. So that, 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 that's the larger context of let, let, Let's go with that, with, with, with that stream of thought and then let's say to explore the, the system, the world that we, uh, we're building, what solution or uh, to what uh, extent the, this kind of system, what is solving the system? The system of identity and new identity, what is it solving in that case? What do you think this system is, is giving someone like you so that it's attractive? To it, you know, like how how does it work for to solve that problem? Well, the first problem you have, I think, very practically, is there's a vacuum of identity, right? So if 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 Europe is gone, I mean, now that I'm in London, but with Brexit, I feel more European. If I have to choose between the two, I, I would I would veer towards the European. If the European Union falls apart, and I, I mean, we are talking hypothetically here, and this is in one sense could be dramatized, but on the other, it's very likely. Then I have a, a, a I have a crisis of identity. I need something new to belong to. Right. European countries um, might not recover their own identity so quickly. Sure, Holland is still an identity, it still exists, but Europe as a vacuum, both in terms of policy but also in terms of identity, falls apart. I need something new to belong to. Corporations, uh, companies, even something like Facebook, is, is, uh, um, is it not that crazy uh, uh, of an idea for those kind of uh, spaces to fill that gap and for you to feel like you can belong to a space that isn't necessarily a nation, but that's something different. Right. So and that was what spurred that idea of, of a collective group of people that are tied together not by nationality, but by belonging to a company or because of their specific use of a particular service. And, and this is the thing, and, and you have to understand from the process that we are doing, and actually one very important thing, the idea is that you interact with the information that we are giving you, right? So at this point, we are setting up the world, but any time that you have a question about the world and how it works, so that we, you, you try to investigate this world, go on, and then, I mean, we have mics, and I think. We're actually gonna jump over to Itamar to finish off a quick overview of the world, and then we can put questions in there. Yes, uh, so the idea is to investigate this world, how it works. First of all, like, the idea is this one. Two quick things about this world. Uh, it came up, you know, how Google or Facebook started as these very DIY, really, you know, liberal, exciting, you know, scrappy companies that we all end up becoming so kind of dependent on and, and other big multinational corporations. This company started out of the accelerator culture, the tech accelerator culture of Berlin, and it came as a, with that same spirit of, this is from us, DIY, we're gonna make these, there's resistance to the general government. So that's why there was buy-in. Uh, and that everybody is now being tracked. Uh, uh, this device is in their home, tracks everything. Your geolocation is tracked, everything is tracked. So that data is being collected to optimize the city for environmental regeneration and to create sanctuary from the EU falling apart and from all these other uh, things that are pressing in. There's only so many people allowed in Berlin because this system did a modeling and said, oh, we can sustain or create regeneration at this population level, no more. So now everyone that has a residency card in Berlin can stay, but if they leave, that's the only way other people can come in. So there's this now a tension between this, this kind of membrane between who can live inside of Berlin and who can't. And, and that's the thing. You have to understand that there is a context to that world that we are creating. So uh, what you were saying in terms of the EU falling, that's part of the context that we gave. So we have to keep ourselves within those constraints. That things hap those things happen for this world to exist. So that's the point that we are trying to tackle here. So this system, it's a solution to that kind of context and problem that we are giving to try to solve through Berlin 2020, right? Um, I will say, I, I will try to suggest some questions, and it is, what are the benefits of this system? Like, what does it bring? Well, uh, the European economy, economy's collapsed, so this is kind of a return, right? Uh, currency is no longer function, functioning as we know it, so um, this is a way to organize a small-scale community in order to, um, I guess, you know, local people would also be providers of the goods that this benevolent corporation is selling, so they're setting up basically um, a small-scale economy just in Berlin. Um, and I guess in times of crisis when everything else is l lighting itself on fire, that sounds pretty good. Great. Um, what, 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 what benefits would you find to a, a world like this in the context of an economy that is in collapse? What other benefits would you find to a system like that? 
How many of you will try a system like this? Why, why, why wouldn't you try it? What so, else? Oh, go, go, ahead. go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. I was just going to say that I think this is a critical feature, what you've identified as a problem in the world, right? You have millions of people who want to get in, and you're saying we're limiting the number to just this flat number. So that's something that needs to be managed. Um, and it seems to me like one of the moves that was interesting that we came up with this morning was a next step, which is that you essentially build in this Berlin of the future of three years away, a free market, we have the possibility of, you know, personal rights are fairly liberal, there is a kind of rebellious feeling, much similar to the way Berlin's character in various periods of history was also representative of all of those values. What, what, what happened in our discussion was that ultimately there was this problem, as you describe it, where there was this fundamental tension between the population trying to get in and the sustainability of a very limited population on the inside. And so what eventually emerged from this corporation, which was, event, which was initially de delivering a very genuine message of promoting Berlin in freedom, is that the state needed, in order to maintain the quality of life in Berlin, needed to start having the cooperation of this company to be able to deliver the messages that would allow the inside of Berlin to feel like the freedom that was there was continuing, but at the same time to take all of the diversity of the pressure from the outside of Berlin and to somehow organize it, diffuse it, stop it from being the kind of pressure that would turn to violence. And fundamentally, the mechanism that we discussed for that had to do with a certain type of propaganda. So what began as an authentic expression of freedom now became a state-sponsored maintenance of a certain kind of sloganism and messaging that came from the government through the corporation to be able to maintain control over the pressure. And so you had messages like, I don't know what, share, connect, be free, which is essentially a message that, if, that encourages people to give up information, to be able to stay often sharing their information with others through the network, and also to experience that process as a kind of freedom. But what the, corporate, what the government realized is that rather than trying to shut the corporation down, rather than trying to somehow publicly stop this feeling of freedom, what if we maintain control by actually promoting this feeling of freedom? And not only do we promote this feeling of freedom, we market hard on the feeling of freedom. And as we do that marketing for the feeling of freedom, we also develop a system for everyone who cannot be inside Berlin. And we present a kind of competition, a race, a set of actions, values, that motivate all of the people who want to take part in this freedom to work, 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 work. Their hope is managed. So we have, using communications and this network, we have a management of hope system for those who are outside and a promise of safety and continuation and sustainability for those who are inside. And rather than these being opposition, they become aligned and move in the same direction. Yes. Sorry, maybe I haven't understood it right, but you always talk about inside and outside. Are you going to build a wall around Berlin? So people everyone is in the same city, and everyone is inhabiting the same space, but only a certain number of people have a membership in this network. Okay, but what I don't understand, if those people, like, they're regenerating the environment, it's 
serving to everyone, right? Also the people who are not in the system will benefit from the things that will happen. Right, so everyone so, who is in the wall, in the space of the city, is cohabiting the space, but within all of that, there is a select group that are the real citizens of the city who can participate in that because there is no economic power, there is no sort of all of the people not in the city don't ha are not part of that same network and economy. Well, it's two parallel networks then, two parallel networks. There's two parallel okay. networks coexisting in the same okay. place. Okay, all right. So I think what I understood is saying the people that weren't in this system aren't regenerating, right? And so you're asking, what are they getting? Well, if they're not regenerating and all these other people are, they're benefiting from all these other people regenerating. What do you think, guys? Does that break your system? And I should say, we, we, we're trying to merge the, two, the analog and the digital conversation. So there was this idea of an analog system and a digital system hierarchy that starts to form within the city. So you guys didn't know about that, about their side. So I wanted to catch you guys up. Well. Um, many authoritarian regimes have taken away the wealth of the people while saying that they're doing it for their protection. So a propaganda scheme for the outsiders seems like it wouldn't break our system. And, and I think this is, this is a key element here. And it's, uh, if you see, it doesn't matter if we start seeing already problems like you were pointing out there, there's already like the benefits. And this is how these systems work as we were analyzing when we were doing the world building of this, is understanding what values we can manipulate so that we are in contradiction. And we understood that there is a state of mind. This is the state of um, not knowing where you are or uncertainty that helps the manipulation. Yeah, go on. Um, I would like to know if you have uh, thought about the trust crisis we have in the world right now and what you're gonna do to um, work against it, so um, the, the propaganda we have with uh, Donald Trump being um, the opposite of that and just um, what, what are you going to do to um, make the communities you, you create so we don't have the trust issues between them and each other? Two things I should say that came up, and again, this has all happened earlier today, but one is that net neutrality is not a thing anymore, so you have to buy in to get fast, you know, like kind of featured access on the internet. So this corporation then became beholden to the right-wing government to get licensing to be able to create this internet of things kind of a system. And the other thing was that the company holds up the value of transparency with all the data they're collecting and they publish daily statistics about how we're all regenerating environmentally. And so there's this sense of transparency and that they're building trust because we're creating more and more transparency and we're building this all in service of the values of the Berliners. And then, but there's, but that's only uh, the way that the world was talked about is that the government does usurp that. And now there is this corporation that's been co-opted because they need this licensing to create the system to make money. Now they're feeding the, the government the data. The de all the data that we think is, you know, locked and, and or transparent, not all of it is being transparent. And there's also this, uh, you know, stuff going to the government that if the Berliners knew, they would be mortified by. Do, do you want to talk about trust and authenticity in this world? I'm sorry, can I give a follow-up question? On that? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. It's just that you, you said that they collect all the data and they control the data, but. You also said that they live in the same city, both the people who are in the system, the people who are not in the system. So what kind of data or what kind of internet information will the people who are not in the system have? Because that's also because they will actually be able to speak with the people who are in the system, so they will, the trust system seems kind of weird for me. So I think that you're identifying again something that's very accurate, which is there is no trust in this system. Yeah. <laughs> but ultimately, the idea is that everyone is on one continuum of trust where only 85% of the people are outside and 15% of the people are the inside, but the 85% are always being told that they're almost in. They're almost within the network. They're almost entering that system. 
And so in a way, from a world story point of view, what we're interested in is to understand if you're on the outside, always with the promise of about to go inside, but you've now been waiting on the outside for 10 years, what happens to your ability to believe in trust? What happens in your ability to think that there is a possibility? You're being given the messages, but how do you actually build that trust in spite of whatever people are telling you about moving forward? You now look around and you say, it's been 10 years, nothing's happened. So basically, one of the central issues here is what is truth in that context? What is an authentic human experience? in that context, and how do we organize hope for our own selves and for our children that still maintains the possibility of being able to participate in this kind of utopian pitched life that is the liberal existence of the city. Over there, yeah. Oh, sure. Hello. Um, initially, you identified a, a concrete value of Berliners as being autonomy. That was something that was an absolute for Berliners. And now you're implying that in three years, they will have submitted to a singular corporate overlord. I mean, what you're describing is a fairly Orwellian state where everybody has to wear their wristbands or else they don't get food or whatever. Um, that's three years is a very short time for a, a, a concrete identity in a city to change. And that's fascinating, maybe, but I'm, I'm not sure. And I would answer it. back, I think you're already living in that Berlin. Yeah. So, so I think I it doesn't so look like there's no policeman strapping that thing onto your wrist. You actually will go and spend $250 on it, if not more. You'll go spend a thousand euros on it and you'll show it to all of your friends proudly as to what you can now do with this thing. And so in a funny way, we feel like everything that we were imagining as this horrible future, if you just squint a little bit, it's already right now. Which I think is why Alex picked a date that was so close to the current date. And to let you know, like so one, the reason that this came up partially was because when, face, when Peter Thiel announced that he was supporting Trump, who is, you know, on the board of Facebook and has a lot of power and a lot of these very progressive, you know, ideal, all the, these uh, technology companies that are trying to be this progressive value system. And he, um, when he announced that, then all of a sudden people tried to, you know, get out of PayPal, even though he wasn't involved anymore, and they tried to think about getting off Facebook. And most liberals that were like, I'm going to get off Facebook. <laughs> and nobody did because they're stuck in a system where everything, whether you're in a marketing context or you have 10 years of your family photos on the, on the thing, that people felt trapped by something that we opted into. So this is, the, this is basically kind of playing off of that, that dynamic that happened when Peter Till announced his. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear what you guys have thought of for dissenters or rebellions or how you get people out of the system versus let them in. I think that's probably a pretty Perfect. cool line. Like, yeah. did, did we pay you to say that? <laughs> um, we actually want you to tell us, because that's where we got to. We got to this setup, and now what we want to understand is, how do you rebel? What can you do? What are the options? in that world where it all looks soft, it all looks like it's speaking the language, you're ready to speak yourself, you have a good life, you have a million people around you who are sort of walking in some other world, but you see them and they're there, but you never talk to them, ever. You have no contact with them. You don't know anything about them. What do you do? What's possible? What does rebellion look like where the very idea of freedom has been turned into a value, a designed value by the oppression? Can I add something to that? Um, so uh, you guys are touching on something that we discussed, which is like, where is that boundary and how, how do we create that boundary? And none of us like the idea of a physical wall, um, because that's reminiscent of Mr. 45. And um, basically, the larger context of 
Germany and Europe is um, diametrically opposed ideologically to what's happening in Berlin. So theoretically, you're having pro Germany or this government, this right-wing government is also like, has his, its own propaganda machine that's kind of vilifying Berlin, which is what is isolating it. So there's this like opposition that works both ways. So theoretically by this point, maybe people who are outside of this community also wouldn't want to be part of it. And then uh, on the issue of children, like we actually talked about, like the way that we got to it is talking about the one neighborhood in Berlin where people, yeah, that's like the most fertile neighborhood in all of the world or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but that culturally in Berlin already, um, a lot of people don't want to have kids and aren't interested in that kind of culture. So that's just something that is more extremely getting pushed in this theoretical world. Um, yeah. So I have a question for people who are wanting to be citizens of Berlin. Is there a hierarchy, for instance, uh, refugees, war-torn people, or anyone that's sort of in absolute need? Do they get a priority on a list of people who want to come in and be part of the citizenship of Berlin? It's well, a great question, I think. Yeah, uh, well, we discussed like, this thing about migration and refugees, and about this uh, thing of hope that is kind of confusing, but we, for some moment, took like, uh, if we were like the government, what would you do with the, with the city? Because as a system has like limited resources. So it's okay, you can invite uh, people to live in Berlin, but how you will manage that resources? So that's the, the, the thing where we separate like the people that is inside the system and the people that is in the city but not in the system, no? Like creating like this kind of hope uh, like in a waiting line, like you have the promise that someday you could be like part of, of, of Berlin, a citizen of Berlin, although you are now living in Berlin. So it's like this uh, way of control that, that governments has like, it's not uh, like a visible authoritarian thing, but more like a, a, a little promise like, okay, just wait uh, a month and then we'll see. And went a year and, and it prolongs and you are living here and you're producing here, but you are not has the, the, the same benefits of the other citizens that are already in Berlin. But that's, that's a problem but that there's like a bad uh, side of that, but at the same time it's like the government have to manage all the resources. It's, you cannot like have resources for everyone, so they have like to can have this control, so they they distribute these resources. No, yeah, we so, talked about the, this hope system, the management of hope. Every once in a while, someone gets in, and there's a big celebration and a big publicity, and there's an event every year where the people who've been chosen to get in and get this membership in this network. Are, are, are celebrated and there is a sense that it's possible and those stories get marketed and told from the human perspective to give a sense that the system is something that both continues and also there's a possible mobility that th ends up not really being the truth. And there's also uh, something that we talked about that because the more you interact with the system, the more the system rewards you because the system wants your data. It wants you know, all of your behavior because um, that's a commodity now for the corporation. Because the more interactivity that you give into the system, the more uh, benefits you get, there's people subverting or gaming that system by having click farms develop. And they're usually refugees that are put into those, that you know, are taking those click farm jobs. So there becomes that, that kind of like, caste system emerges. And people can theoretically get booted, so if you're, if you're being a baddie, uh, you, get, you open up a spot for somebody else who's more deserving. Uh, all right, so I think there's a problem since there were narrative, 
for us filmmakers, I think we know that uh, since a long time ago, uh, we are fighting about subjectivity, about surprise, about uh, something neorealist uh, kind of developed about going on the street and seeing a basket in the corner and fucking uh, being disrupted by the whole reality, uh, being disrupted by something uh, different and something you are not expecting, something like some like farms are doing. So I think just uh, continuing uh, the same narrative about uh, politicians, uh, Trump, uh, Brexit, uh, we are building now. It's just continuing the same kind of thinking, the, the same kind of farm mind that it's have turned us here. I don't know. <laughs> it might, uh, just to understand what you're saying, you're saying that the world we're describing feels to you like a continuation yeah, of, of the world that no, really we are living in it's now. It's the same world. It's the same world. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Like it's not 2020, it's That's 2019. not the problem, though, that you're describing, or that is the problem. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, we agree with you 100%. <laughs> yeah. Like, in a way, sure. we're saying, let's take the real world, let's pretend it's a fictional world, and now let's fight it in a fictional space in order to try to think differently about our reality. Yeah, but does that make a real change? I don't think so. That's, that's what Sky Five films are doing right now. Like, I don't know what's their names, but yeah, they, they propose an Sky Five alternate reality where everything gets gentrified, blah, 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 blah. You are not making any change. Much sci -fi has been done. Right, so I agree with you. I'm not suggesting right. that Hollywood science fiction is fundamentally progressive. I yep. agree with that. <laughs> but I guess the question is that given that it's not progressive, yep. put yourself into that moment and imagine that you're a character in that same non-progressive Hollywood sci-fi movie in this world that we've just depicted. Mm -hmm. How do you rebel? Uh, you have you can do whatever you want. How do you rebel? Is there any mic? No. Yeah. Hello. Um, I I just um, I don't know how you would rebel, but I was listening to this idea, and I found it. Um, like very dangerous, like what you're proposing. I don't really like it, to be honest. Uh, tell, I, tell us why. Because I think it's in the same logic of materialism and capitalism. I think you are talking about credits, and for me it's the same as a credit card. Um, okay, I don't see the money, but still it's like a system where you reward with points on materialistic issues. And uh, if we're talking about sustain being sustainable, we need to open up and understand that exactly why we're thinking in that way, we have become what we have become. So because we want to have more materialistic things, we are doing things, you know, working more, um, making wars and so on, because we want more money to buy more stuff and so on. And we are in this wheel of materialism where that it's important. When we, if you really want to fight this, according to me, um, we would have to invent a system that would be inclusive and that would be for free for everyone to join. And if you want to reward me, I mean, I would love to have like a watch where like all of my good things would be rewarded. And I think that's a good idea, you know? Or maybe if we skip nations and we like, everyone who agree on, you know, doing these values and uh, like having some kind of, um, you know, discipline in our lives. So we actually work, you know, on a common goal uh, can be belong to a same network that also rewards you, you know, uh, and so on. So that, I think I like that idea of somehow like connecting through um, issues that you want to put, it, put um, uh, that you're going to improve. But I think it's very, very dangerous to talk about uh, living in the same space and only some are part and some are not because what happens, you know, if I can be part of the system but my sister can't or my son or my brother or whatever or my friends and of course I will fall in love with someone outside of the system 
I mean, well, I just want like to I just want to take a quick moment to, to say the, the the goal of this workshop was to create the most oppressive system we could come up with, and okay. this is the system that we came up with. Oppressive. oppressive. So the oh. the whole morning session that all these ideas came out of was to create the fort, and then tomorrow we're going to burn down the fort with all the strategies to oh, okay. to yeah. usurp it. So this is not something that is a we're not presenting this as as a, as, as a world we want to live yeah. into. Yeah. We're presenting this as a world that scares the shit out of us that we need to <laughs> mitigate. And what I think is really interesting about it is it's, it does come the the world that this group imagined. Mm -hmm which I didn't anticipate walking in the door this morning, actually came through our liberal ideas yeah. that this oppressive system was able to take hold, not through the like, right-wing ideas that, to, that suppress the liberal ideas. Actually, through the liberal ideas, we were vulnerable. And, so how, and that, I think, is interesting to think like about how you, we're vulnerable. Well, you just said the description of the world you want to live in and how you want to live in it. I imagine that a person living inside the network in the world we're describing in Berlin if you asked them this question, would answer exactly the way you asked, yeah. answered. In other words, you would be a typical person living in this world that we're describing because in Berlin, everything goes with the values, exactly the values that you said. Mm -hmm. And well, so yeah, in a way, I, that's not, in a way, that is that, that feeling of, I don't like this world, I want it to be a different world where there are no nations and there is no war and people get along and so on and so forth. The government, the evil government we're describing here, they want you to keep saying that. They want you to keep saying it because in a sense, it's ineffective. You can keep saying it and we can all applaud you and we all share on Facebook the same ideas over and over again and then Trump got elected. Yeah, we all were you know, sure I'm, we I'm had this Chile. in the bank. We have uh, other presidents in our history that have been just as Trump. So I think it's just for the United States that it's new to have like a bad representative. It's not I mean, new. Yeah. If you go to Andrew Jackson's history, we are ashamed of our some pretty horrible presidents so in the past. <laughs> we have to remember. Yeah. trying to think of something that is possible, is going to come out of the chaos that we have now, that seems to be sort of tumbling step by step. All of us didn't expect it, but here's Brexit, here's Trump, next week there's going to be Holland and then Le Pen and France. And we, we all thought said of that. that basically, even in this situation, if someone on the, yeah, if I see on the internet a pair of sneakers, Adidas sneakers that are a good price and look good and they want my social security number, my wife's name, my child's name, my address, my credit card number. I'm, I, we all here, we're like, sure, absolutely, go for it. Here it is, take it. That's, that's why we thought of that, not because we like it, because we wanted to provoke and find out how you rebel, because basically a lot of that is actually happening already right now. There is the privileged there are other systems of the privileged, there are other systems of the not privileged, there, there are the fences, the walls up, they're just virtual, you don't see them, you don't recognize them so much. You give, in, uh, you give away all your data, the rights, when you sign up in Facebook, which is this nice um, idea of how oh, we communicate openly with the world, which is true to some extent, but you give in all your rights. So never forget about that. So, so a lot of these, these uh, things are happening right now. There's massive data tracking. It's very, very easy to track a profile of you walking around and, and depicting exactly where you are what, uh, at any minute of your life, basically, and, and give a profile of you as a person, how you are, what you're interested in, where you move around, um, how many time you spend with this and that and that. Google is, is when you Google things, uh, you will have a filter, which the, the idea of Google is that you find your, your information quicker, but they select the data you see, and if you don't know that, you, you, you don't have like information like in a newspaper anymore, where the newspaper is the, the same thing for everyone buying this newspaper. You have select information already, filtered, bec uh, concerning your, your, your ideas and your interests, which is good to one extent, 
which is very bad on another side because you only get the information, you're in this bubble already, you're in this system, you're in your own system and you don't see um, the whole picture anymore. So it, a lot of this is happening and, and we did the provocation, not saying that we like that. Yeah, and then I'm, 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 I'm going to make a reflection here precisely in the, in the process because at the end the idea is to understand how world building is building this. And if you see, and actually it's nice that it happens, at some point we start immersing ourselves in that world and finding the good and the bad and then this contradiction starts happening. It's because we are creating a world that we can immerse our, ourselves in. But our provocation was, okay, it's 2020, we can build any world, yes, but let's start for the things that we can extrapolate, the things that are right now happening and how can we optimize it? And that was the word we were using. How can we optimize it? We made it a design problem to optimize the hope of people, the necessity of people, the way that people were handling the system that we're living in to make it precisely appealing, but at the same time, this balance of stripping people from another choice. Why? Because that's the only way in, we, in which you can understand how to rebel. If you don't understand the system, you cannot rebel. So what we did first was to optimize our knowledge of the system and the world. And this is actually how world building works. You first try to understand the world, the dynamics, and the implications, so that the people that you are collaborating with enter the same platform and can imagine themselves. We identified two visions in world building. One is the programmer, the one that is above, that is trying to create, create the system, and the other one is the explorer. Right now, you're explorers in this world because you're taking your own personal experience into that world and, and saying, what the fuck? And then, <laughs> like, experiencing these kind of reactions to the world that we're building. So this is, this is just a meta-reflection on the system, also because now it will be great to spend some time thinking how to rebel, but... So this is actually a very interesting section of the world build that we're doing through all the different world builds that we've done. This is sort of, we got to come up to you and not really tell you that we made this oppressive world. We didn't want to trick you or anything, we wanted to see the reactions. And a lot of you are like trying to be very polite about it. You're like in there and you're like, this is terrible. Um, what about this? Because you didn't know. And world building is a tool. This is methodology. It's not just a lecture up here. You guys can use this. This is an interesting and really fun way to get some really authentic feedback about a world that you're building or, or a story that you have. Is don't go, okay, I, wrote, I have this idea for this oppressive world. Just walk up and say, here's the world. Watch their reactions. Like, were, did you expect something different? You guys made a pretty oppressive system. How did you feel when you had the reactions and the questions out of this? I mean, it, it was amazing to see that um, every one of you, or I think a lot, uh, clicked into this thought and idea. And um, I think quite a few of you felt trapped uh, in, in some way. And of course, what is, what is great uh, about this session here is that we would really be very interested in what would be your personal rebellion and what would be your idea to either escape the system or in some way to, to fight against it. And, and this was sort of the idea also of the session to really provoke and see what would you do uh, if you would live in 2020 in this Berlin we created this morning. Yeah, I, what I think is really hilarious is the only way I could think of rebelling would be to live there and then leave and then make like a documentary or a film about how <laughs> fucked up this world is and try to get it in festivals and shown around the world. So I think here comes the revolution. <laughs> let's let's think Lots of one of documentary word. films. Yes. Let, let's think of one word. I mean, like let's let's hands raised and that's great. Keep it there. <laughs> but uh, we thought of a word that it's hack and we put it there before hack the future, right? So let's think of ideas in which we can hack the system. Let's, let's think of these hacks and then hopefully these haps, hacks help us rebel. So let's begin one, two, three, who was there? Four, okay? Okay, what about like hack Fitbit thingies? Or maybe if you can change your Fitbit thing to give it to your brother because he's not in the system but you want, we want to share him inside. How, how does that work? And how long will it take for the people inside to be suspicious about everybody? 
because maybe they are like hack, the, 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 the hack users, and how long will it take to build a wall? Two. Yeah, uh, even before you mentioned the word hacking, I was always thinking about Mr. Robot. Like, as you described the story and everything else, you don't have to go even two years uh, in the future, you just have to go in the past and look at the Amazon show called Mr. Robot. There you have a group of hackers, individuals from different kind of, um, how you say, social communities and backgrounds. And what they do is they stay inside the system, which is more or less seems very similar, except the greenwashing stuff. But you have Evil Corp, which is ruling the financial system, and they are even behind everything else you can't even judge from I, I don't really mem remember the second season it's a little bit uh, further away than I've watched it but yeah you have the group of hackers and it's very also how do you say surreal because you don't know where oh, those boundaries between hacking and free world are ending let's let's expand the word hack so that maybe other people have other ideas beyond the realm of the digital because actually we tackle both we tackle the analog and we tackle the digital, right? You can hack someone's behavior by creating a different kind of dynamic. You can hack uh, the way that people move in the, or the, the way that people relate by other types of hack. Hack is taking a, a system apart and putting it together and understand how to break those boundaries. So let's think beyond the digital, even if obviously the digital is part of the hackings. There was this, the yeah. three, there was the, where it was, okay, here. Then the five, the six, the seven, the eight, the nine. Okay, that's going well. <laughs> um, I think, um, like Nash, we don't. If we all focus on Trump being the bad guy, we need to get away with. We have to focus on what created the way to Trump. So we have a lot of people who have been overlooked, also with the Brexit and around the world right now who is trying to do that, but they are not informed and they have lost the power of conversations in that part because they haven't the money to live and so they have to survive and by surviving they lose uh, the, uh, the power of um, the information that they have to have to understand the system. So let's say you're in that world. Yeah. So what you're I in think Berlin, and you now need to make a connection of the kind you're talking yes. about. So what How would you do it? I would like that we um, that we help each other. So um, in what in what way we um, can manage in the state that we are in. So if you don't have, um, you, if you're not strong in a moment, you can always just go um, race a bike if it had fallen and then you did something good for, for people because when the person comes and sees, oh, my bike is standing up now, some people did something nice for me so I will do the same. So there you evolve something and if you create so that would you say and, this and the uh, conversations between that, you evolve as a um, virus into the system where we can talk to each other and see each other and trust each other. And so here's what I'm what hearing from you. Do. I love that. And what I'm hearing from you, though, is you, in this world, would get a few people together, and you would go out, and you would just start doing good things. No, no, that was, yeah. No, and, I'm not yeah, laughing at you. I'm, yeah, li I'm literally, yes, that sounded and, like what you said to me, yeah, yeah. Yes and no. I'm saying that that's, um, with the people uh, supporting Trump, supporting the Brexit, they have lost the powers and they could start just by picking up a bike. But you could also, we have, uh, I come from Denmark, we have this organization for the foreigners coming to us and they say, I need this to survive here and people meet them and learn th them our language and, and make sure that they are adopted into our society so they are not a small society in our society and we make sure that they are informed and they are taught to, um, to have a life and get rid of um, the fear that they have been running from. And that is what I think we should do. 
because if we all start running from, from the fear that we're living in, because the war against terror is just terror, we're just terrified of it, but they have won because we made a war against it. So if we start getting rid of that terror and creating hope to us, that I think will be a great solution for your system. But I think um, that this information has to go in both ways. Because sometimes it's like, okay, these Trump supporters or Brexit supporters, they are not informed. But sometimes we are not informed of what they need, why they support Trump, you know? So sometimes it's, it's a matter of, okay, let's uh, spread this information about what's happening to them, but then we have to have a feedback on why they're doing that, why, why they support Trump, because we, we want that they think as we think, you know? But the problem is they don't think as, uh, as, as us. So Trump is not the problem or the Brexit. It's all the people that have needs and, and see in these guys like a solution. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you don't have to change Trump. You have to change these people, but you have to change you too. Like knowing what's happening with them, not just informing that you have a better life and they can be here. So let's go and we can be there and then understand what's happening and break the system that is uh, from below, from with the people, not jump in and try to break Trump, you know? So, so that yeah. That's what I was uh, meaning. And also, by conversation, you also have to listen. Yeah. Let's, let's continue with the ideas, and then maybe we start gathering all the ideas. Who was next? I mean, like when I mentioned. I lost. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, one, one important thing is, um, I think, to, to think about what we give up if we were to leave the system. And, um, for example, for me, it's very easy to make offline walks around the city. I don't have to be tracked. I don't have to be online all the time. But um, being inside the system, you, the way you described it in this world, you have a lot of advantages by being online and, um, and inside the system. And for me to understand your world better and also to develop a story that might, um, that might break this world or set it on fire, it, it's very important, it would be important to me to understand what, um, what was at stake, what would people have to give up uh, when they leave the system. Uh, one little remark. It's actually not so easy to uh, not be tracked, even if you don't use a, a, a phone, because there is drone technology, surveillance technology, already existing, which covers square kilometers um, with, with uh, filmic images constantly, every move. So and that, is not, that, that is really happening already, and it's coming more and more. Let's, let's keep in within, I mean, like, that's, that's true, but let's keep within the world. Like, well, to, to answer your question, the, the idea was that since we, Germany is uh, ruled by a, a fascist government, um, Berlin is opposing that, um, so the government uh, cuts off the incentives, and in order to be self-sustained, Berlin says, okay, we create this own system where we can survive. And by that, we, we sort of fall out of the rest of uh, fascist Germany. That exactly, yeah. Well, then, then you would be part of the fascist uh, surrounding uh, Germany and, 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 and the rest of Europe, basically. Yeah. So it's, it's a way to opt out of society because you don't believe in it, which goes back to what I was saying at the beginning, which is where maybe the people that are in charge are people I can't believe in, and so selfishly I look for something different. It could be escaping to a virtual world, you know, maybe virtual reality or, or maybe game spaces are gonna be even more popular in, in, the, in these times. It could be uh, local clubs that you'll become a part of, but, but it's about opting out of society, and what you give up is having to go back into real society where you are subject to whatever laws the government has in place, and, and again, if we look at the way that Trump is now challenging the courts in the states that may involve not being able to protest and, and, and 
voice your opinion, for example, or, or, or it, you know, there's, there's many issues there. Let, let's see the other ideas on the hacks too, because we are, have even more hands raised. I yes, think it was so. next, and then you. That's um, interesting. Uh, yeah, so you're asking about resistance and how people How might, do you revolt? How do you revolt? I mean, I, I'm not saying this is the right or the wrong way. I'm not putting that on it. But through violence, ultimately, you want to, who are the board of directors, target them, hack, literally, hack the Fitbits from them, leave a trail of corpses, create terror, and, and all of a sudden you've, you've got a revolution of some sort against the system. Right or wrong, I'm, I'm not saying, but that is a way. Right. Um, uh, let's 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 think. I mean, just just in terms of world building, this was the the one thing that brought them to power. Mm. So sometimes violence in these kind of systems that are brought by violence will only empower them because they, it will be the ultimate <coughs> resource, right? So just just making a note on how, for example, these images were contextualizing how we arrived there, yeah. and then not because it's wrong or right, but to, sometimes these systems are based on precisely what we fear, right? Mm. And in this, in this case, everything around is violence, so they, they gave another choice. So ju just saying that actually violence was part of why they were empowered. Mm. Also, it seems like we've, just to capitulate or recapitulate, there's three options on the table so far. One was a grassroots effort that had to do with going around and actually making connections. Another was a movement that people would sort of recreate an underground that would allow them to feel authentic again because they were not being watched all the time by the surveillance and part of that machine. And the third is good old violence, you know? Let's keep, let, let's keep hearing the ideas. Um. <laughs> sort of cloaks of invisibility, yeah. So, I mean, the one thought, I think it's an extension of the other thought, the obvious thing is to uh, cross worlds, is to, you're, 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 on, you're in the Fitbit world most of the time, but, you know, what will happen, I think, naturally is there'll be a poor community, say, who are not part of the Fitbit world, but are living in Berlin because it's cool, because of the liberal sort of people that are there, you'll hear about the cool restaurant where, oh, you actually have to go and get some Deutschmarks and pay to, to go to that restaurant. And I think this is interesting because to a certain extent you could tell yourselves, oh, this is rebellion, but you can see how it's sort of delayed, it's delayed part of the system. Like no doubt the corporation would go, oh, this uh, restaurant's very popular with our community, let's gentrify it and swallow it up into itself, but I think there would be people that would feel like they were doing their bit of rebellion by getting, stealing some Deutschmarks, by talking to the refugees or the wannabes. And I just think uh, cool is something to think about, like the equivalent of hip hop or whatever <laughs> in this culture will be produced by the people not on the Fitbit. And it will, the, the artist community will be the people not quite yet on the Fitbit. And just to think, how, where rebellion sits in cool and where it sits in culture. And the weird irony, of course, in that kind of social situation that as soon as you've discovered something, you ruin it by discovering it. Yes, so it's okay to go to that restaurant as long as we're one of the first 12. But yeah. three weeks later you go and it's like 90 people in line that all have Fitbits and you're like, oh, forget it, this place is dead, <laughs> it's over. So in a way, it must stay sub rosa. And, and one of the things that if you see that contradiction, it's actually part of the sophistication because that's the whole point. Like we were trying to think of systems that could engulf 
eat the generative like bits of rebellion, right? So that's part of how do we hack a system that actually adapts and adopts because it's the hope of people. At the end, that's the system that could oppress us more. One that is based in hope, right? And this is kind of this thing in which when you give people hope, then suddenly the system is gonna always adopt. And as you say, uh, suddenly we'll, we'll start gener but how do you hack that kind of system, right? One, two, ah. Uh, let's go out over there that the hand was before. Okay. I've been thinking about um, to hack it, you would be inside, but you would be overburdening the system. Get someone inside, or a group inside, and then overburdening the system, exploiting the reward system, making sure that the places were actually providing for the system are so overburdened by providing to those people that they can't actually provide to the people who actually want the system, so they would get a worse and worse and worse and worse uh, product. And that, I don't think, actually think that's one of the ways that people actually start hating stuff. People start hating Facebook when it's not working. When it's down for an hour, people already want to quit it. Mm -hmm. So if you can overburden a system like that, you would get more and more just to just leave. What I like about this suggestion, for example, is that it's already using the system against it. Like, uh, that, that is the process we are following. Let's try to understand how the system works for themselves, for itself, for what the, the agenda is pushing, and then use it, use the very inherent logic, the DNA of the world, and reverse it or use it against its own. Um, Just like, a quick, quick case study on that. Does anyone know, uh, know Eve Online, the franchise, the gaming franchise, Eve multiplayer online game? Yes. Yeah. So we had uh, one of the creators as was one of our creative advisors, and he came and gave a whole presentation about the rebellion within the EVE universe. Are you guys familiar with that rebellion? Yeah, the, the goon rush. Right. So for those that don't know, they, this is an, a, a kind of a free system, and, and they tried to, one of the longest running multiplayer online games. And the, the creators, the developers, tried to put in some like reward systems to try to get a little, like create a store and you can purchase these things and to create a little extra income for the company. And it got rebelled against by the 500,000 daily active users. And they created this coordinated effort to basically melt the servers. Yeah. And now they have to have a Congress annually with the top EVE, like kind of, you know, people that are running, you know, have their fiefdoms within the system, they have to consult. So the people that run, that own the company that runs EVE, they, can't, they, they don't have autonomy anymore to run this, the system. They have to literally have a hold a Congress with, um, with the rest I'm, of the I'm going to jump here with a suggestion that Boris uh, did us. And um, let's decide it's going to shut up for now. Uh, <laughs> and we're going to let all the ideas here because we have like five minutes more and we want, we want to collect all the ideas that came out from what we did here and what we're going to do here is make notes and try to voice your idea the best way possible so that we get it. So over there, who, had, who has raised your hands? So one, no, one, two, three, In the middle. four, middle, middle, okay, there. Hello. Um, I just find it important to understand a bit better how closely this corporation or city are working with the right-wing government because would there be an interest in, for example, this company supporting people outside of Berlin in other cities who want to rebel against the right-wing government and then expand their so-called idea of the city? Or is there no interest in that at all because that would conflict with their interest of being able to exist as Berlin and so on? Because then, like, do they want to expand their concept or are there, is their loyalty to the right-wing government too high to do that? Okay, let's answer that very, very quickly. Do you have an answer for that? I mean, we had put our evil hat on and, and thought that the corporation would probably have, the uh, political party in power would probably have majority share in that company as a way to create uh, multiple systems of, governan of, 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 of governance depending on the population. So we'd imagine, you know, again, in a, in a way of the conflict of interest that Trump has, that this political, that this company would be serving a political point. It would be a benefit. But it could equally be the opposite, as you describe, and it's all hypothetical. Mm. It's all about exploring the idea. So that we had thought about it the opposite way, but your, 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 your way is also super valid. 
But if that's so, a way of rebelling could be people, because there are obviously going to be a lot of people who would want to join something similar, but readapt the way that it works or change it. So then you could set up alternative systems. Yeah, you could find cities. a way to buy out in some way the, the government and own it yourself, and it becomes people-owned, <laughs> absolutely. And this but, is something that happens now with governments, right? Governments are constantly sharing the success and failure of their use of power and their tactics of maintaining power and are constantly borrowing and looking at what's happening in Singapore and what's happening in the UAE and what's happening in the Middle East and what's happening. I think these systems get scaled, licensed, and in many ways r the rule of, of law and societal organization has become a product. Sounds good. What, what I will res res rescue from there, and then we continue with the ideas, is the fact of setting up your e energy not to fight the system, but by creating a, a parallel system that will make the other system obsolete in the in sense of food. You just create a new system of like creating food so that you, you don't need that other system that is oppressing, if I understood right, right? You're creating your own food, you're growing your own food, so that you don't, you don't need the system of food. This is what I understood. Uh, Great. And I think yeah, you raise just a, a, a fundamental piece of the process of world building is that you, the, the, why, the how could this possibly work, the kind of diving into the logic of the world is really crucial. And I think you, you hit something really like uh, specifically important which disrupts the whole system is could you possibly sustain all of Berlin by closing the border? Could you actually not have trade? Could you not have food come from outside? I personally don't think that that's uh, realistic, and I think you have to therefore immediately break the rule you've set and say, how does Berlin both have a certain kind of political autonomy, uh, but it still has to engage in trade. There is a, there's a level at which I think reality is a really important um, kind of check, check and balance here um, generally. And I think the same is the, for the question of whether the corporation is owned by the government or is in alliance with the government or is capable of fighting the government. I think you can look at lots and lots of examples in the world and you can break down the logic of that and say, really, if you kind of get down to it, a certain set of conditions are going to prevail and therefore all of the logic of the world has to follow that. I, I think that brings to, as, as Alex was saying, you know, the fact that, and, there is one thing that it's very important, and is the iterations when you create a world like this. And for example, this exercise with you guys is precisely that. We, we have an iteration of the world, now we are putting it up there, and then other questions start ri uh, racing, and then you start seeing where, the, where were the spots you, you didn't see before in the construction of the world, right? And in that sense, you, 
there is this word in German, vorstellen, that it's imagining, right? You put in front. I and mean, by putting it in front, as we're doing right now, then we are able to see it and react to it. And then you go back and then you revise what you thought or not. And as Alex was saying, then you revise the rule that you put to that world and you see how that system is going to interact for real with that question, for example, and that problem. But what is interesting, uh, there is actually, um, um, not now, I, I, I would say it's not working, but there is urban farming projects on a factory level. Um, I think it's in the Netherlands, and they're making fast progress, extremely fast progress. So they really think about there are two, uh, two different uh, projects. One is always on the roof, and then there's another one. It's only with artificial light, and the, 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 the plant factory is fully automated, and it's already working. They are doing these prototypes, and it's exactly for, for that, uh, not for our situation, but it's meant if there's not enough space, you can have farming inside a city on a factory level, and it's actually experimented right now. Okay, some other ideas so that we don't lose anything um, here and then over there. I was thinking, what happens if the 15% used all their points on the 85%? If you've evolved by the 15% that are in this system are using their, uh, the points, the credits they have in this system on the people that are not in the system. You would buy stuff and then you would give it to people. Because these points are... you. Now, if I'm in the system and I have this Fitbit, then I can buy stu physical stuff for my digital coins. And if I buy stuff and everyone, if everyone uses their points and people that are not in the system, then the system is not exclusive anymore. Well, if I want to revolt, I do it, and then I make other people see why they should revolt and do it. I don't like screaming. Um, no, I just, uh, with all this conversation, I, I just wanted to comment something that um, I think in this system that you invented, um, like the oppression, um, when we look at human history, we always have like the bad, and whenever we have a bad uh, man in common, we kind of get more uh, united as a group. Uh, and I was remembering my father, he was in, uh, in jail uh, during the Chilean dictatorship and he was in this uh, work camp in the north of Chile in the desert for 10 months. And when you hear him describe this moment where they had like a common enemy, uh, he says it's the best ti time that he have seen of humanity in his in whole life. Because everyone who was inside of this work camp were solidari uh, solidarity between each other and everyone uh, organized also with making food and making all kinds of stuff and communicate to the outside world secretly of course and you had to trust the other person like really really because otherwise it could mean that you would die you know uh, so I think when we talk about these things we need to think about who is the one who's oppressing like the system you invented somehow at some point when I didn't know it was a game sounded to me like a Nazi hipster thing, like you have to be <laughs> ecologist. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> like our, you have that's to be space. ecologist, hipster, you know, yeah. to do this. And how do I rebel to that? Uh, and I think it's kind of part of human nature to have a bad uh, enemy, and we have been living like this, but this is also the reason why we are stuck in this very violent system. So how do we get, maybe not hope, but solidarity uh, as something that grows within the community? Uh, because I think it's important, is, yeah. I think it's a super important thing that you just said, because part of what we see in the world now is this moment where rebellion seems impossible, but at the same time, days like the Women's March gave you the feeling like, do I dare believe that we can actually do this? Of course. And we then can. you kind of go, of course, when you look at your daughter, you say, of course we can, honey, this will be it, it'll be fine. And inside you're thinking, I have no idea if we can do this and if we can do anything. And then you realize every rebellion comes out of a moment where basically the odds are slim. And sometimes it works. 
And that's a very important thing to remember. It's never like, oh, we got this, no problem. Let's just have a rebellion. It's definitely going to be fine. We're awesome. It's always like we have no chance. And we have one tiny chance that's a little bit more than the no chance. And the idea that people sometimes all together decide, let's do this, and, and is an amazing thing about humanity. And in a way, I think it's important to realize there's never like an easy rebellion. It's always doomed to fail, and yet sometimes it doesn't. And that's part of where the thinking, I think, now is playing its game. Uh, unfortunately, I think we're, I we're going to have to close I was the... Four. Sorry? I was four. He okay, was then let's let four. <laughs> I'll make it really quickly. Yeah. Uh, I think in the narrative part, um, I think it's dangerous uh, for hope to a rebellion, to a fake rebellion. Like I think there's a more dangerous part of pollination that it's just believing you are doing something uh, rebellious again. Like, I don't know, being vegan or there's, <laughs> there's really biggest things, big, bigger things to think of. There are real uh, structural ways to to disrupt, and in the other way, I think it has to go with the first thing I, I, I said that it's in the form of the message. Um, I don't know the, the the thing that I that I try to think more about it's film, and I think the form the form of the film is one of the of the ways of disrupting the thinking of the people, not just giving them the content because that's already in, that's already on books. There's a lot of Chomsky books each year, uh, but I think giving them the possibilities of reorganizing their, their thinking and thinking by themselves, mostly. And in a way, what you're really talking about is education. Uh, <laughs> depends on the way of education. For sure. It's over the system because nobody else has points. So instead of giving the opportunity for the other ones to get in, you just eliminate the system because nobody's in anymore. Nobody has points. You just hack the system, delete all the points, and everybody's in the same situation. And then you can create a different system. <laughs> like the airline companies do, they erase people's points. <laughs> just using their own uh, <laughs> working method. I, I think, um, is there any other things, ideas that are lost there that you wanted to give on the rebellion? Very quickly. It's, uh, it's just a thought, I, um, what happens when you succeed? What do you want to do with the world afterwards? I, I think that's important that you take that with you as well. That's true. That's a great way to end, thank you. Um, I, first of all, um, could we all thank um, the talents here who actually kind of instigated um, these narratives. This is a fantastic conversation, but first of all, a big hand for everybody who worked this morning. Thank you. And now for you all, because I think these were great provocations, I think that the crucial thing you've identified is question, question everything, um, make this system robust, you know, make these narratives powerful, can we actually create stories collectively that are capable of solving these, these you know, deep, serious issues in a way that we can't just by creating a kind of fantastical and, and somewhat untested single author um, narrative. Uh, I think it's precisely these kind of um, sort of uh, uh, pressure cooking of of ideas that makes these ideas robust. And I think there's been some, I mean, some great kind of subversive ideas. The, the ones that seem the most um, subversive are the ones that are the most surprising, you know, like use kindness, you know, the, the Women's March when Trump cleared the mall of all the police in the desperate hope that there would be some kind of riot and the women just helped each other, made, made more space for them to march peacefully. Um, uh, and, and there's a way of, I think, taking on rebellion in a completely unexpected way. But I, ultimately, the, the question is, 
how does the narrative persist? I think there was a great final statement. How does this actually become a rebellion that is successful? Um, anyway, um, tomorrow, unfortunately, I'm not going to be with you guys, but I'm really curious to see how the, how the stories evolve and what characters perhaps you can create that can carry these narratives with them. Um, and I would encourage everybody and continuously in your storytelling practice to uh, look for the truth and don't just go, you know, because you want an idea to persist, it has to be there, because I think it's only with this kind of serious uh, questioning and, and hammering at these ideas that, that the human condition kind of comes out. And I think that's really important not to, um, you know, not to just go with an idea because it's cool, but to go with an idea because it's, it has genuine power. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Thank you all. And uh, we will look for the result tomorrow and publish it accordingly. Cheers. Thank you.